But actually, to be honest with you, I the plan the plan for the last panel was to ask everybody to move up closer if it is uh, if it is not too much trouble. And it, I would much rather us have a discussion rather than just like a, a more formal panel. Also, I don't for this one we don't want to have any formal questions. The idea is to wrap up the the conference and the seven week program and you know people should be free to speak you know whether you are on this side or on this side and and, and in general i just want to get uh, people started but then uh, you know again i don't don't, don't follow the preset topic in in any way okay So one way to summarize the conference or, or this program is that we had a lot of topics. Like we had uh, everything from cross sections to to lattice QCD to various DSM models to ice cube, supernova, collective oscillations, nuclear synthesis, and then many things, including experimental and, and theoretical topics. So uh, when when you have such broad scope. I, it's probably not fair to say what are the most important questions or which things are more important than others. So instead, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, this way. So suppose you are the head of the NTM, right? Or suppose you are doing postdoc selection for the NTM, like a hypothetical person. Let's call him Andre. And then this Andre receives proposals in all these areas, right? There's somebody who is proposing to do lattice and another person who is proposing to do like a, a global fit and another person who is proposing to study nuclear synthesis. So ha, like one thing to identify are what are the promising areas in the next several years and how do we, and this is an open list. So anybody should feel free to like throw a topic saying, I think this is cool and we should support uh, postdoc applicants in this area. Does that make sense? That's one way to pose this problem. Joachim. I think that one of the most important things in the coming years is to resolve the short baseline anomalies. The problem is to do that, you need experts from all these fields that you mentioned. Right, that's very good. So what do we do to resolve the anomaly? You can pass the mic to the experimentalists if you don't want to answer this. <laughs> Fine. How is this going to get resolved? I mean, let, let, well, me, let I, me say I'm going to work on the assumption that Miniboon definitely saw something and we want to know what it is. So how do we establish what it is? Whether it's Well, a, all, all the new data that yeah. will be coming in from new short baseline experiments will certainly help mm -hmm. but to interpret that. Mm -hmm. Um, well, we need on the one hand the experts for neutrino interaction physics. On the other hand, we also need the experts for BSM physics. Uh, we need the experts from cosmology and astrophysics because that's where some of the strongest constraints on, on many BSM scenarios are coming from. So, as I said, you need experts for from all fields. And, and departing from the assumption that they may or may not be related. We should test each one of them individually. So for Miniboon, we have a plan. For LSND, the Japanese have a plan, but I don't know that the US can offer much in that direction. And for the Galen anomaly, I don't know that we have a plan at all. So yeah, maybe we should think of a plan for, for sure. Galen. And so you have applicants who want to do cross sections, let's say. What the next question is, what kind of cross sections? Cross sections is actually an open-ended thing. So this is one case where our discussion that we had here, I think is actually terribly helpful that if we can understand the details of your you know the, the detector performance and establish which things are super important and super sensitive 
for the analysis of the next uh, four or five years and which things we can sort of know okay and still be happy, then that would really direct uh, research in the, in the right direction. So, because the thing about theorists is uh, you have your area of expertise and then, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you say that, oh, well, I am an expert in, in the nuclear ground state. So then, you know, to every, Buddy who says, you know, I need cross sections, you say, you need my code. But maybe the relevant thing is pion production in this region where you have high level resonances. Maybe that's the thing that's going to affect measurements at NOVA the most. It would be very helpful to know, right? Because, you know, people's years of life. It's a postdoc, you know, you can spend three years working on something and then it turns out the effect is 3%, whereas there was a 26% effect next door. So I think that would be uh, very useful for, for our community. Other thoughts on, 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 on the next uh, three to six years? I was actually very excited by this, uh, uh, the, by the plans of IceCube, right? That IceCube is gonna get this infill array and your thresholds drop to one GV and your expected sensitivity to the oscillation parameters becomes really impressive because at the same time, you're gonna have T2K and NOVA and uh, Zoya said that they will double their data in the next time, in the next four years, right? So, so, you know, there is a possibility of an interesting tension or development. And I think actually having those tensions is something that we shouldn't overlook. Like even this current situation between T2K and NOVA is already very informative. And like, if you only had T2K, you would say that the hierarchy is definitely normal. And the CP phase is sort of maximal delta uh, th three pi over two. and we don't need another experiment because the other experiment would just measure that to more precision, but we already qualitatively know the answer. And it's very fortunate that we have two of these experiments at the same time. So, and if we have an, a precision ice cube measurements on the atmospherics at the same time, maybe there'll be some more to the tension story. That would be wonderful. So that's like something that we can look forward to in the next uh, what, four to seven years. I don't know what the time scale is on that. Together with that, we have, uh, we are going to have in the next year a super K that is going to be measuring the same region as the, as a uh, as, uh, deep core, for instance, at the GB scale, the multi GB region. So you will be exploring the same flags with two different detectors together also with ORCA. And yes, if any GSM physics, uh, or anything new appear in one detector can be very interesting to be tested in both of them because we are going to explore, explore that particular region with uh, several detectors. And you have common systematics regarding the cross section because it's water in both cases. And you also have the flux, okay, which is more or less the same. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I generally like experiments that uh, people think are redundant because that may prove crucial for us to discover something new. I'm very worried when people do these plots where there's like sensitivity as a function of years running because that can hide the, the real physics potential of these experiments. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's one way to approach the problem. The other way is to look at interdisciplinary connections, right? So you have, in, in, even in cross-section physics, you have anything from low energy nuclear physics to hadronic physics, to, you know, lattice, as we, as we heard here. So we, we had lattice people here for the first time. And I certainly learned a lot by, by having them here. But as a community, we should probably, you know, make sure it's the first meeting, but not the last meeting. So maybe 
the MTM should encourage these kinds of interdisciplinary developments, right? If, if, if the goal is to define something for an MTN like uh, an NTN like entity. I, I can make a, a repeat something which I think the last people said. Maybe they didn't say it, but maybe they could have, which I think should apply more overall for this cross section business, which is it would be nice if we had, I would argue, more concrete uh, connections with the experiments in such a way that we could make lists of requirements, you know. And I think that we did hear about this in the latest, one of the latest talks, I think, you know, it would be nice to be able to give them targets. Yeah. You know, you what should they be able to, to compute next. Yeah. What yeah. do they need to compute next? Uh, what, what precision? And then who picks up the football and then runs with it to, to sort of, you know, it's a, this is a multi-step calculation, especially for Dune. And uh, it would be nice to have a list of, you know, a to-do list that, that would say, hey, we need this and we need that and we need this other thing and that everybody agrees on the list. Because as Alex said, uh, I, I think we have been playing this game of talking to different experts and every expert has a different solution to the same problem. And it's not the expert's fault because they're experts. So they, they're experts on that one thing and that's the one thing that they really like because that's the one thing that they know. So it would be nice to, to have a concrete list of topics with concrete goals that we could try to reach. And if we had that, uh, that's a great thing for funding purposes. Because if you're the person that says, hey, I know how to do this item on the list. And if I had an extra postdoc, we could get it done in, in three years. And, and somehow having a list that you can go to and say, hey, you should fund me because I'm doing something that's important for this list. And just as an example, we as a, I'm from the particle physics community. We have made lists before, and they have been successful in the context of the LHC, for example. There is a list of, uh, you know, perturbative precision QCD calculations and electroweak calculations that have to be done. You know, we, we need to do X jets at X NLO, and we have to be able to do W production and Z production with, you know, 20 loops or whatever it is that these people know how to do. And, and the fact that those lists exist is a big deal because again, you know, if you write your proposal, you can say, and I wanna, you know, I'm checking this item off of the list and this is my plan on, on how to do that. So, so I hope that, you know, as Alex has said, neutrino physics is exciting because it's very broad. You know, if you wanna learn about neutrinos, you have to learn lots of different things or you have to have lots of friends. Uh, uh, and again, in order to, to make progress, we are making progress in lots of different directions, but having these opportunities to have everybody in the same room to talk about what they know and what they like, I think it's a good way of uh, making progress. And things have been getting, uh, uh, I would say better. I think we're, we are a growing community that's getting a better sense of, of, of who we are, I think, which is great. Uh, yeah, I think everything you said um, resonated and this conference was a great opportunity for uh, this to start happening. But I was thinking, so SNOMAS is a process where the community is supposed to come together to make decisions. I think my, it being my first SNOMAS, it seems like we take all the information and we try to distill it down to move things upward, which is very important, and then onwards to P5 and HEPAP and everything. But these discussions happen, maybe one other outcome of SNOMAS should be a list that we share between ourselves. And I think there's already a place and structure for that, but maybe SNOMAS can have both objectives uh, and this one also being explicit, that would really be helpful. Thanks, yeah, I, um, I mean, I think, you know, it's a great, uh, goal to have a, a list of what would be important for uh, experiments so we could say, you know, th this is what we need theorists to work on. But I think, uh, you know, if, if we kind of go, you know, speaking as an experimentalist, if I go to T2K or June and say, we need to, we need to make this list, it's very unclear how to do that, right? Because, um, you know, we can, we can show like the impact of changing 
the axial form factor in a particular way. But if we go to the slightly more complicated uh, systems, it's very difficult to say like, what is the impact of uh, if our like, you know, final state interaction model, as we call it, like the you know reinteractions of hadrons inside the nucleus, when we only have like one very wrong model to test that with, right? Like, um, um, or we could approach it from a different way rather than saying, okay, this is how we can change our analysis and get things wrong. We could think like, okay, what what could really go wrong in pion production? Like, you know, if we have like a, a resonance model and it's like 20% off in normalization, it probably doesn't matter. But if we have like a few percent difference in the relative rate of like charge current single pi plus production versus neutral current single pi plus production, that would be way, way more important. But it'd be very hard for us to show that in like a really quantitative way. Uh, and so I, I guess my question is um, how we, <laughs> you know, there's still a bridge, right? Even if we agree. Uh, maybe this is something we can learn from, uh, you know, the uh, collider experience that you were referring to, but I, I don't have a good roadmap uh, for how we would do that. And I think that, you know, I certainly agree we need to do work on the experimentalist side to help support these efforts. But I think trying to be a bit more um, concrete would, would really help. So there, you know, there so may be some value to iterate this. Yeah, I, I yeah, theory I, and experiments. Yeah, basically the I. I think that having something like this would be incredibly useful. And I agree, it's not something trivial that we can just sit down around the table and decide amongst ourselves that that's what we need to do. But I think as Allah just said, it's a process that has to iterate. And as you say, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. And there's a lot of uh, workarounds that have worked very successfully in the field for a few generations of detectors. So it is very tempting to bet on the fact that these techniques that we've been using in the past will still be successful, and they might be. But I think it is important to, to you know, perhaps in, in terms of the big collaboration, especially for the next round of experiments, to have a more dedicated, careful look into what's the stuff that could go wrong in some, in quotes, catastrophic way, so that we're prepared and that, you know, maybe this particular process will not be a big deal, but we don't know because we haven't gotten to this kind of precision and so on. So it would be nice to have a, a, a systematic evaluation of you know, failure modes for uh, you reaching some goals that you have in your experiment. And I'm sure that didn't make any sense at all, but, but I think it's, it's, it's something that, at least for those that are watching the process but not participating super actively in it, we, we feel a lacking in, in terms of uh, 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 studies going on in, the, in collaborations that, that, that it, it, there's a feeling that there's a certain level of care that we haven't gotten to yet that we probably need to get to in order to be confident that this very big investment that we're making will really pay off. I mean, I think that's the, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, we don't want to be overconfident and then fail at the end. I think that's, I, I hope that everybody agrees that that would be bad. Uh, but but somehow we don't get a feeling that people are being ultra careful today. And I think part of the reason for that is that people are very worried about all kinds of other things at the same time, and they have to put out the biggest fires first. But I think as uh, as things progress, there will be a time when we will have to worry about these uh, 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 theoretical things we don't know. So it would be nice to start thinking about what are these theoretical things we don't know and, and how much better do we think we might need to know them, even if it feels overcautious or even if it feels like we can handle this in a different way. I, I think that's, that might be, and again, it's a hard problem but I think it might be a necessary thing for us to do in the next five years or so, so that we're not blindsided by something silly, right? I think that's the... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do completely agree with everything you said. I, and I, you know, uh, I think my question was more how mechanically we can do that. I think uh, maybe I thought of something else as you, were, uh, as you were speaking, that an additional issue is that because of the way funding works, and you know these large, very expensive collaborations are maybe 
it, it, people worry, I think, about being put in a strange position, right? Where they kind of say, this is a way in which I will fail if this isn't solved, we don't know how to solve it. Um, because, you know, we do fairly uh, preliminary studies of this type internally, which aren't shown, right? Um, and I think, I, I don't know whether a strong statement from the theory community to like leadership on these experiments would help, like, you know, bridge this gap, because there's a sociological problem as well somehow. Um, but anyway, thanks. I appreciate what you said. I, I, I agree. So since you asked for like specific mechanisms, so we can like consider specific mechanisms by which we can iterate, right? So Arthur talked about several effects in cross sections that when you look at electron scattering, you very clearly identify some targets. So you can take uh, these, uh, the, these problems and generators, which are known to exist from electron scattering, and just ask what, if, what does this mean for NOVA? Like how much of an impact does it produce on you know, energy scale calibration, you know, the resulting oscillation sensitivity? Sensitivity to some kind of an SI scenario where you care exactly about the energy spectrum that you get in the end, stuff like that. It would just be very helpful to, to gauge those impacts. I mean, what about uh, the axial form factor? So what if the cross section is larger because of the lattice axial form factor? So then the two nucleon part has to be reduced. So let's make that adjustment. So let's simulate things using some default genie tune and reconstruct them using, you know, these alternative scenarios and see, do we get an interesting systematic shift? So there are papers of this type, which are kind of tests uh, that, that are out there, right? So there's this study that, that, that we mentioned. And, and also there is a study by, by Arthur, Patrick, Pilar, like where they, they took out neutrons and maybe you can say more about that. Yeah, so that that was a toy model study, so I want to emphasize that, the, that, that it, it wasn't as serious as uh, I don't know, running giant or anything like that. Uh, but we uh, we considered a scenario in which neutrons are not observed, and then uh, we wanted to understand uh, or in general, we want we wanted to understand if there's some some source of missing energy, a and we understand it to twenty and so on percent. Uh, does it hurt uh, in the context of uh, of delta CP uh, measurement uh, or, or not? Uh, so then we 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 did, within that toy model we determined to to what extent you need to uh, understand your missing energy, so so it doesn't affect significantly your delta CP violation measurement. That was done in a toy model. We wanted to stimulate uh, much more serious uh, simulations, but but I don't think any serious study happened after that. Yeah, and so iteration could proceed along these lines. Now that I have a microphone, I would like to just make a, a very general reflection uh, I think related. In the past, every every experiment uh, used to develop their own generator because you know in the past they were not very sophisticated. It it, it took some small amount of time and, and um, manpower to, to do that. Now we are uh, in such a sophisticated uh, era of precision that that this is no longer a sound approach. So, so we've switched to uh, to much global frameworks, uh, such as let's say Genie, uh, and in the future probably Marley. But when a code was owned by an, by an experiment, it was easy to for an experiment to to make a feedback and, and to make changes, make make requests because you know they own the code, so that was immediate. Right now, I don't think we have a, a, a mechanism to, to ask for changes or implementations or, or even vague directions of, of the development. So I think it would be good to, to 
to create some some feedback and and we need to be aware that that there's a potential to to uh, abuse the system because i can imagine that tears would ask for, for the latest development to be Im immediately uh, implemented so we, we need to be aware, aware of that but as a community it would be good to uh, to provide a feedback for some directions not perhaps uh, specific papers but of what is directions thank you uh, so not to continue on this topic too long, but the last point you said was exactly the point I was going to mention that one party that is missing in this discussion between theory and experiment is the generator. And um, a lot of times this iteration, we would love to have this iteration too, um, but we have only certain models readily available. And even mentioning iteration, like you mentioned back and forth. So, I showed some results in one version and some results in other version. That's because personally, I was in charge of producing certain samples and it takes us six to eight months to generate new samples for something and then doing analysis if we want to do it starting from the right model onwards. So that's why we sometimes resort to these fake data studies where we can try to capture just some essence and do it. But that is the part of having a model and checking it with data, it's a very long process. And sometimes it doesn't belong to any particular person. And that's why things get prioritized in a way, as Andre was mentioning, because everyone is resource limited. So I think we need to have generator people and maybe a better framework and things like that to, so that this iteration becomes easier. Um, maybe I'll take this a little bit in a similar direction, but um, um, so, you know, we like to get, uh, you know, come to these conferences and, and, and say, you know, we need uh, better um, understanding between theorists and experimentalists, and perhaps we're getting to a, a point in time where uh, that divide is going away and, and, and people need to know both in order to, to do good physics in the next generation. Um, but, you know, we go back to our institutions and then um, the people who hire, the younger people will, you know, will hire, uh, <laughs> there will not be, a, let's say, uh, a preference for people who kind of are in between or do both or kind of... Uh, you know, are not well defined. So it seems that the lines in what we think we should be doing and the lines in what we are promoting in terms of hiring and funding um, are on different, um, in different places. And so how do, we, how do we solve that? Because you can't go telling people they need to know everything and then only hire people who know one thing very well, you know? Yeah, it's a... Hiring is a is an interesting question, but uh, one aspect of this is that every major U.S. university, almost every, has a neutrino group these days, experimental neutrino group, and there are far fewer neutrino theory positions of any kind. Whether you're doing cross sections or supernova neutrinos, there are far fewer of these positions. And so one thing that at, at the LHC they figured out is at the LHC there is an understanding that theorists are essential for the full process and so very often you have experimental groups going to the dean and advocating that we need a theorist working in this area. This has not been the case for neutrino physics. So as I say there are all these uh, departments with with you know large and sometimes very famous neutrino groups and so they could go to their dean and say, we need a theorist that works with us. I think there is work to do in that direction. And it, 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 it is at least an identifiable problem that in neutrino physics, historically, you know, the, the physics is very integrated, but the, the several communities which are sort of very isolated. So for a while, neutrino experimentalists thought that they could just get along without theorists. It was true when you're looking at a factor of three deficit, you should devise like something like the snow experiment, which 
is the way to resolve this. But in the next generation, I, I really think that you need to have a strong theory community in the US for the support of, of this program. And so like people in hiring committees and deans and so forth have to be told this message that there is a qualitative change that has happened over 20 years that should be reflected in different hiring policies. But you, you said the LHC community has it figured out. I'm not sure that's entirely true. <laughs> For instance, also in the LHC community, it's incredibly hard for people doing software to get jobs, both on the theory side and on the experimental side. Um, and I think we're facing a similar problem here because as, as uh, you said, Arthur, the, uh, in, in former times, every experiment had their own generator. Now the generators are public. Now, in principle, the generators are open source. So no one prevents an experimental collaboration from taking the generator and modifying it. The only thing is you need people with expertise on that topic. And that's a full-time job. I mean, being an expert on Genie is a full-time job. Um, so someone needs to put money on the table to hire a software expert. Similarly, on the theory side, um, if you do novel conceptual developments, you may have a chance of getting a job. But if you then uh, say that you're spending 50% of your time putting that into a generator, that's an important service to the community, but it will not get you a job. Well, so maybe the message should be that it should get you a job. Yeah, I think software <laughs> development should, should have the same like reputation as hardware development. If you're a hardware development expert, you can get a job. But if you're a software development expert, mm. it's much harder. Mm. I don't think it's true that neutrino generators are uh, in general open source. Uh, I mean, Genie in particular is a good example. It's not truly open source, right? Like you, you can take some parts of the generator uh, and you could privately make changes to it. But if you tried to publish anything with that, you would find issues. <laughs> like you, you, there, there's an established procedure that Genie want you to follow, but it's, it's very difficult and quite, uh, it, yeah. And there's certain aspects of the generator you can't see unless you're a Genie collaborator. Uh, I thought about No, it's not. Yeah. No. Anyway, I mentioned astrophysics as a physical neutrinos. There is a lot to be said there as well, right? Because astrophysical neutrinos are between several fields, certainly in the US. They have one foot in nuclear physics, have one foot in astrophysics. And there are more feet, right? <laughs> there, there are some feet in, you know, in, 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 in HEP and so forth. So, um, I, I, in this program, as you notice, we brought every side of this community here, but uh, as a, like in, in the US, certainly there is like N3S, and they have a collection of people and they talk to each other, but sometimes it's difficult to know what they are doing inside of them and then the, and who, and who the people are. And then there are people who work with Dune experiments. And probably they could benefit from having connection to this broader, you know, nuclear physics community. And then there's the whole ice cube thing, which is really an interdisciplinary subject. So how do we do this, right? I mean, there are people who can fall through the cracks because when you apply for jobs, then you are neither, you know, an astronomer nor a particle physicist. Any thoughts on uh, astrophysical neutrinos and uh, how they, their disdain for boundaries between fields is impacting our research? Um, I, maybe it's not exactly what you were looking for. But, um, one thing I feel very strongly when I come to a meeting like this is, is everybody except the neutrino astro people are, are very focused on error bars, like theory error bars, experimental error bars. And the neutrino astrophysics community is more in discovery mode. And that's fun and it's exciting. But one thing that I would like to see more from our community that I think would help to uh, help us interact with other people is to try to produce sort of 
theory bar, error bars, even if they're living theory bars and even if they're, they're very large, then, then you, you're no longer this, and I'm comparing my experience with the R process when um, uh, EFRIB is coming online and one has to decide what to measure. And so then it becomes important when you make a prediction of the R process, say, to put some sort of error bar on it and to see where you can shrink your error bar. What could you measure to, to shrink the error bar? And that's something that I would like to see the neutrino astrophysics community do. If, uh, for example, if you have a simulation of a supernova and you predict your average energy of neutrino, can you put, can you uh, change things, the equation of state and so on, and then produce a living error bar, knowing that that's not the final number, but just as an expectation of where the error, where the uncertainties in your simulation are, are coming from. And that helps you talk to yourself and it also helps you talk to to other people so that's my two cents yeah that's certainly these boundaries between communities sometimes yeah asking for an error bar can can, can, it can, can be over interpreted yeah it can yeah. be over interpreted yeah, yeah. Maybe a better way to sell it to that community is to, to ask for sensitivity studies rather than error bars. Same thing, mm -hmm. just different yeah, language. Sensitivity studies, that's, a, that's another way to say it. Yeah, well, I mean, we had uh, great discussions of astrophysical neutrinos today, but there is certainly more than, than we covered in one day. And since we're talking about communities, so one interesting thing about astrophysical neutrinos is they can constrain a lot of BSM. And here you run into this situation where different communities consider like a successful experiment measured in different ways. So for example, you know, I, I was uh, telling Ibrahim earlier today, I, lo I'm looking at the, energy spectrum of ice cube, you can say maybe there are some absorption features, which would be very interesting from the BSM point of view. Then you go to people on the collaboration and you say, what do you think about these features? They say, there is no feature. Don't believe your eyes. Even if you see it deep, there is no feature. The same story in Planck, right? If you have in Planck, you can actually read the section which studies neutrinos mass, neutrino masses and, and effective. And the bounds within that section are actually pretty involved. So if you have masses and, uh, and effective at the same time, then you, you, you get some interesting parameter space where you could fit a partially thermalized neutrino or some other relativistic species. Uh, then the, the abstract of the same paper says there is nothing to see. There's like N effective is 3.04 plus minus, you know, 0.2 or something like that. And that's because people measure the outcome of Planck, how close it gets to boring. And, and so there's like this, there's this cultural thing that in, in, in BSM physics, you are excited when there is a possibility of something going wrong or some tension. But like you go to experimental collaborations and sometimes you, like, you say, oh, I'm very excited about NOVA and T2K now. They say, there is no tension. There is, um, there is nothing. <laughs> it's like, you know, can I be excited? Is that? <laughs> uh, well, just as another example, the microwave uh, result was a, a long result from the microwave experiment, but the, phenomenal, the BSM phenomenologist two weeks later put out a paper that said actually this may be a signal of new E uh, disappearance, right? That's right. Uh, you want to say something about that, Matthias? <clears throat> I mean, I think it's good to be uh, have caution, but I also understand that it's our job as phenomenologists to think to ask the question, "What if?" And in the case of Microboon, uh, I am very curious about this deficit that happens throughout uh, several channels. I I I, I wouldn't. I don't think I believe it's new disappearance. And in our paper with Joachim and others here, we do not find a greater than one sigma preference for new disappearance. Uh, but it 
it's certainly something that at the two sigma level seems to exclude the, their prediction of the backgrounds. And that does sound very interesting, you know, irrespective of what you believe about oscillations. You know. I think in general, it is uh, frowned upon among experimentalists to uh, make any strong claims when you're not sure. So that's, I think, part of the problem. We may be secretly uh, be excited about discrepancies that we find, but uh, we, since so many discrepancies go away eventually, <laughs> you don't want to make any claims that's okay, you'll, but that's that you'll what... regret a, day, uh, a year or two later. That's why we have an in-person meetings. You can make an official statement that there is absolutely nothing wrong with our data and then say, I'm really secretly excited. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, this, okay. maybe this is a bad example, but I remind people about the faster than light neutrinos in the yeah. to grand experiment. Or we can remind people about solar neutrinos where there was yeah. uh, this anomaly for yeah. 20 years or 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, everybody, and everybody people thought... said something must be wrong about yeah. it. And, yeah. and everybody thought that uh, Ray Davis was uh, wrong in this experiment. Right. Turned out he was right. <laughs> so. Either Bacall or Davis were wrong, or both. And that was uh, enough for people not to pursue this further. So we well, did, but it eventually. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Anyway, there's sort of a cultural uh, bias against it. I think it all goes back to what Matthew said. It's whether or not you can uh, absorb the what if, because if you are running an experiment, you're fitting some something. If you cannot rule out other possibilities, you can you still have to deal with that what if. That includes the ice cube uh, uh, spectrum. So if if yeah, the simple power law may be the best thing that you may be able to do, but you cannot say that it's got a power law with a cutoff. You cannot rule out that there is a maybe a dip, right? Right. So that if if you cannot rule out that, you should be open for any possibility, and then that would be some scenario that people explore, and maybe someday either be ruled out or be. Yeah, True, I mean, right. I'd much rather say that people look at these crazy models of absorption troughs and say, I could get money, right, for fun, for, for, for doing Gem 2 yes. with, with something like that. But instead, you know, there's kind of like, oh, there, there cannot be any feature. So that's, you know, that's, a, that's a cultural statement. That's not a statement of physics. That's just a... Yeah, the thing is, <laughs> as long as what if it could be applied, I think it, 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 it could be addressed. Right. You also mentioned earlier that, that some people measure the success of an experiment by how close to a standard expectation uh, in the measurement you get, right? Um, and maybe that's the case in here as well, where you really expect the power law, and actually you expect an e to the minus two, and people got more worried as it got a little bit softer, you know, over time, and uh, and that alone was enough to like worry people and say, what's going on here? Right. Let's investigate this further. So in terms of features, you're, you know, so people, maybe some people tend to measure, you know, how successful this experiment is by how close to the prediction it was and not necessarily by how precisely can I make a measurement independent of what I expected. Um, right. so. I mean, to me, Ice Cube was, was extremely successful, not only because it detected astrophysical neutrinos in this ultra high energy range, but also because the original models that were motivating it turned out not to work. So we have, uh, we have been uh, given a puzzle and, and puzzles are good. Yeah, and uh, going back to uh, an earlier discussion, this might be somewhere that theory and experiment conversation is become more and more important because uh, the simplistic scenario that everything can be, for instance, explained by a simple power law. This is not what it, the, the theorist would tell you, no matter of when you ask them, because if you are looking at acceleration scenarios, they are not going to give you a simple power law with, that goes from an like infinite amount of energy. This is totally unphysical, right? So, but 
As an experimentalist, I can understand someone has some limitation because of the data, statistics, systematics, whatever. But if that uh, information, has, that understanding has been transformed, deviation from a simple power law is, would not have been seen as a bad thing, actually. It can be indicative of actual physical scenarios, which is very important to pin down. Right. Yeah. Anything more on that point? And one question to say is we had people here from different, quite different fields collected. So I'm curious whether it has been useful to people from different fields to be together. So Andre, you're nodding. So you are like my case study for this question. So you came here and you're listening about some crazy stuff about astrophysical power laws and so forth. It's great. Is that is that useful? Very useful. Okay. Great, great. <laughs> where's my list? Yeah, where's your list? So, uh, transition uh, matrix element, <laughs> delta production. Okay, I got one. Okay. A any other thoughts about the whole thing? Seven weeks. And not everyone will, uh, has been here for seven weeks, but still, any thoughts? Then I will, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat what I said last time, last week, we had a similar discussion. So uh, we are, as organizers, we're going to write uh, the report to wrap, wrap things up. And uh, we would be happy with any testimonials. If you say, this has been helpful, I learned something new. I met people that I never met before. It's helpful for my research. Please send this to us and we will transmit this to, to KATP because they really like to see that they are bringing people together. Another thing that we discussed the last time is there's, um, we think the frequency of neutrino meetings at KATP could be higher. So it has been every 10 years on, on average. And we think this is way too long, especially given the variety of physics and the pace of developments in, in modern neutrino physics. So the, the proposal is to put in a proposal quickly. So, so we as organizers of this outgoing program, we're going to write that we talked amongst ourselves and we think that every three years is more appropriate for this. And since the, the wait time between the proposal and the actual workshop can be as long as three years, then it means that some of the people in this audience should start thinking about submitting this. And so we heard, uh, so Flip was very enthusiastic last time and Mateus is gonna talk to him because he also appears to be in an excited state. Yes. And, and, and hopefully you know, people can join and you know, start thinking about the next application. So, so we do our part where we say, the next meeting on a shorter time scale is very motivated. And then a, a, a new team has to submit a proposal next time there is a call. Any thoughts on that? Is that good? Does that sound reasonable? Send us the testimonials and think about proposing the next program. Could you send a reminder? We'll send, we'll bug some people for testimonials, right. I think that's probably a good opportunity to thank the organizers of this workshop for what they did. So Martha is not here, she bought a house. So <laughs> <laughs> anyways, so thanks everyone. And uh, tomorrow is still the last day of the program. So all the physics you meant to discuss, but haven't yet. Now is, the clock is ticking.